and a special thank you, Jim, this is your cue, to the supporting host, the Nonprofit Association of Oregon. Um, and then, your, Jim, you're gonna come up and speak. So thank you all, have a great day. Thank you, Megan. Um, wow, what an amazing group of people we have here today. I am so honored and lucky to be uh, allowed through the front door with this color hair. Um, and, and I, oh, okay, there's, there's one or two others out there. Yeah, yeah. Power to the young at heart, right? All right. Um, we, we are uh, the Nonprofit Association of Oregon, so we're the State Association for Oregon. And back about three years ago when Kate and Meg and Jess and that, that amazing team, Meg and the group at YNPN Portland were talking about, hey, we, we, there's this thing called YNPN and we wanna re-energize it and we wanna get it going here again in Oregon. There had been a YNPN Portland back years ago and it you know, had fallen on some harsh times. And, um, their amazing leadership has just has just blown me away in pulling together this organization in just three years, um, and to, to to wind up with hosting the national conference for YNPN. And um, I just really want to congratulate them on all their amazing work, their hard work, all that group of people that are again not even in the room because they're out there still registering folks coming in. Um, so uh, join me in thanking them. So the, the, um, the, the young nonprofit professionals here in Oregon, I think, are some of the most uh, thoughtful, caring, and inspiring people I've worked with. And I'm very proud to see how they're changing the way that we think about social good here in Oregon and particularly here in Portland. And I'm, I'm looking forward to you know, participating today, seeing what all of these ideas from outside of Oregon, how that mixes up in this big pot that we're gonna see today and how people are going to come out of this more energized and more activated, right? You're gonna be activated. Um, I'm really proud, I wanna do a personal shout out to my team of young nonprofit professionals, and if they could just raise their hands. Um, this is my group of, uh, at NAO, who, who they work behind the scenes uh, at NAO oftentimes, you know, trying to make sure that all across Oregon we're helping to emerging leaders, people from communities who've not had a voice get their place at the table and prepare for what is a real generational shift. It's happening now. The, the silver tsunami, if you've heard about it, it's happening. And you, you folks are gonna need to step into these roles and we need you to be prepared and we need you to have and bring that enthusiasm and change the way that we're thinking about social good. And so I'm very excited to um, be a part of this and to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker today. Um, so we were thinking, NAO was thinking about bringing Vu here to Portland because he is such a, uh, a great provocateur. Um, you know, he's that guy who is evocative all the time and provocative a good percentage of the time, which is what our sector needs. Um, he and I were just joking about, he's, he's sort of got Bernie Sanders conscience with a Donald Trump mouth. <laughs> and and we, we really appreciate that about him, is that he's challenging all of us not just young nonprofit professionals, not just young nonprofit volunteers, but he's challenging all of us to think differently about how we engage in society, what we're gonna do with this democracy in America, what we're going to do with changing the way that we value the people who serve other people, don't underpay them, right? Make sure they have health insurance, make sure that when you get to start being my age, you actually have some retirement plan. You know, there's a point at which people are going to need to be helping to think about a future. And I know that you all, a bunch of people say, retirement plan, what the hell is he talking about? So we need to really think about the way that we're um, valuing the people who are the backbone of our sector. So um, without any further ado, I want to introduce you to Mr. Vu Lee, who is 
the executive director of the Rainier Valley Corps and the blogger of Nonprofit with Balls. So, Vu. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Silver Fox, for that introduction. <laughs> Appreciate that. I just came up with that nickname for Jim. I uh, really appreciate being here. Um, I love Portland. And I just, like, the people here are so great and so creative. I saw a guy wearing a Batman Speedo <laughs> with two samurai swords strapped to his back. <laughs> and I thought, that is so Portland, you know? <laughs> and then I got some kombucha tea and I prepared for my presentation. It's, it's great. Um, and it's also really great for me to be at these conferences. Um, mainly because I get to meet really good people, but also because I get to steal office supplies. Look, I got like two Sharpies <laughs> for my nonprofit. <laughs> I got a whole bunch of pens and like eight tote bags. So it's been, it's been really cool. Um, so today's topic, where is my PowerPoint? OK, let's see. PowerPoint? Does this work? Ah, there we go. Where am I supposed to point this thing? Where is this? Over there. Point at me. Point at you. Okay. No, over here. Over, over here. there. I'll point. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm sorry. It is on. All right. So today's topic: What the bleep is social good? <laughs> this might be a little challenging. I might need someone to. Say, yeah. Yeah, can I just like point at you, Amber? Do you mind if? OK, great. All right. Amber? Slide. OK. All right, what the belief is social good? Actually, we were discussing the title for this keynote presentation. And uh, this was what we came up with. But originally, there were some other ones that we had discussed, including what the F is equity? <laughs> and. What the frack can nonprofits learn from Battlestar Galactica? <laughs> that was actually my personal favorite. And if you don't think I can speak for 45 minutes about Battlestar Galactica, then you don't know me very well. All right. Um, so, stuff, by the way, I spent so much time last night trying to find the perfect picture of Battlestar Galactica for this slideshow that I don't have any content for the rest of the slides. <laughs> It's really just pictures of baby animals. Um, but Japanese researchers found that looking at pictures of baby animals increases your productivity. And, and their hypothesis is that when you look at pictures of baby animals, you're put in a better mood. And when you're in a better mood, then you're more productive. So just think about that, hashtag self-care. <laughs> so we'll be talking about a whole bunch of stuff. Um, social good. I want to talk about how awesome we are as a sector. Yeah. yeah, we'll be talking about some of the challenges we have with societal expectations, um, the overhead myth, the sustainability myth, bisplaining. We'll talk about social good and the paradox of social good. And then what we need to do as a sector and what kind of leaders we need in this time and place. And if we have some time, I want to talk about Nonprofit the Musical, uh, which is a project I'll be working on soon. But a couple of disclaimers. One is I, I have a five-month-old baby, so I haven't slept in five months or so. And last night, I had this thing where I can't sleep, like the first night in a new hotel, a new place. And it was really hot, and then it was really cold, and I, I stuck out one leg under the cover. You know that thing that you do, you stick out one leg? And it was, it was a little challenging. So basically, I'm hallucinating this whole conversation <laughs> right now. I think we have some Q&A time where you can ask me to clarify what I meant. Uh, about stuff, okay? Disclaimer number two, I don't claim to be an expert on anything. I am, I'm just a dude who writes, uh, who directs a nonprofit, who's been an executive director for about 10 years, and who writes a blog. Um, and in the US, if you write a blog for long enough and you're, you know, you say stuff and you put up pictures of baby animals, someone's gonna invite you to give a keynote speech. <laughs> it doesn't really mean that you know what you're talking about at all, right? So I don't want to claim that I represent anyone. I don't represent communities of color. I don't represent other nonprofit people. 
I don't represent good-looking, intelligent people everywhere. <laughs> um, you're on your own for that one. And disclaimer number three is that the topics we'll be bringing up in this short amount of time is going to be complicated, complex, and we may not have time to go really deeply into, into all of them. And we also tend to be very nice individuals. Please feel free to disagree with everything. I'm hoping this is really more a start to the conversation. Disclaimer number four, I actually haven't given a lot of talks that are live stream, so I'm kind of creeped out right now. <laughs> Hey, everyone who's watching this, <laughs> I don't know who you are. I don't, right? So anyway, hi. <laughs> I'm sure you're really awesome people, and I love you all, but like, I can't see you. And so it's like, it's a little unnerving, OK? OK, why we are so slide? OK, oh, wait, wait. In addition, Japanese research. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. This whole thing is throwing me off a little bit. Why we are so awesome? Nonprofits are really awesome. We contribute about 5.5% to the GDP, about 800 billion. And we're the third largest sector in terms of employment. One out of every 10 people who have a job are employed by our sector. And we're actually growing faster than, than the for-profit sector. And uh, you know, this is in addition to all the families we lift up and all the trees and animals that, that we work with and we save. and. So we're pretty amazing. And in addition, Japanese researchers found that we are the most attractive professionals <laughs> among all the different sectors. OK. Yeah, I haven't slept very well. Next one, please. <laughs> but we have some challenges with society's perception of our nonprofit sector. right? People don't really know what we do sometimes. And we don't really have a lot of representation out there, right? Whenever we have something, it is always, for example, um, someone who's trying to remove kids from their families. And the kids have to get together and put on a talent show to save the family farm and keep themselves together. This is the image that people have on TV. Or I was watching Law and Order, Criminal Intent, and there was an episode where they found a nonprofit was illegally selling human organs from its basement. This is ridiculous. No more than 5% of us are legally selling human organs <laughs> from our basements. Right? This is, we have 19 shows about cakes and so many shows about doctors and lawyers, and there's not a single show about the work that we do. And we have amazing, really interesting, suspenseful stuff in our sector. We should have like a show about all of us having a fundraising meeting, you know? <laughs> Or like a bunch of finance people filling out the 990. <laughs> Just so much interesting. No, we don't have any of that. I'm working on some shows. Um, for example, The Great Supplies Race, <laughs> where like, like a big nonprofit or a bank goes out of, or they decide to move or something, and then they send out an email. It's like, free supplies, we're moving. And then all these nonprofits just rush to get the free supplies, and we'll follow them. Right? Or actually, the musical, working on a nonprofit, the musical, which is like Hamilton, but better. <laughs> and I really started thinking about different characters and plot lines and things and songs for this, for this uh, musical. For example, we have a consulting robot, which is basically a robot that repeats exactly what the ED says, but the board actually listens to the robot. <laughs> or a development director who is played by a new actor in every scene. <laughs> and no one points it out at all, like the entire show. Right? Now, if society's expectations were just irritating and annoying, then that's one thing. But it's actually been affecting the work that we do. And we have to really address it. So one is the overhead myth. And I know that Cherry Navigator and GuideStar and, and others have written a letter you know, just debunking this whole overhead thing. And I think that's good. That's a start. But it's still something that plagues our sector. Recently, with the Wounded Warrior Project, you know, it's, it, it's, it's brought up again. Look, look at Semper Fi. Foundation, they only spend 8% on overhead. And I, we are really nice people. So we accept this. 
and we haven't been pushing back as much. But it's really ridiculous. And if we had to learn how to speak the language that people can actually understand and hear. So I use a metaphor. I use a cake uh, bakery metaphor, right? So imagine if we have a bakery, right? Uh, we're, we're in Portland, so we're gonna call it the, um, the Dusty Apron Gluten-Free Organic Bakery. <laughs> All of our goods are made out of hemp. <laughs> and a customer comes in and says, hey, I wanna buy a cake to, that, that will serve 20 gluten-free veterans. How much, how much would that cost? We hear that you, you make really good gluten-free cakes. We say, yeah, it's gonna cost $100 for, for that cake. And we say, okay, yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm gonna give you $20 because I never pay for 100% of any cake. So you had to go and find four or five other people to buy this cake. And we're like, okay, you know, we know four or five other people who love gluten-free veterans. We're gonna, we'll find them. Here's my $20, but with this $20, I don't want you to buy more than one egg and more than one stick of butter. I don't like vanilla. That doesn't align with my funding priority. <laughs> and I don't want any of this money to be used on electricity because that does not directly benefit gluten-free veterans. <laughs> and, and you need to spell out in this cake baking plan. And if you, if you need to change the ingredients or something, then you have to email me three weeks in advance to ask to change the ingredients. <laughs> and then they come back later, and they're like, this cake is not chocolatey enough. Like, it's really dense. What's, what's, what's going on? And we're like, well, I'm sorry. We had like all these customers. They each have their own restriction. And then our thermometer broke down, and no one would allow money to be used to pay for this thermometer because it is overhead. And yeah, this, this, is, this is what we got, you know, sorry. I'm like, well, you know what? I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna buy a cake from you again because you don't have any baking capacity. <laughs> and then another person, another customer is like, dude, that guy was rude. I and eight other people bought a blueberry bun cake from you last month and it was delicious. And we say, well, thank you. Would you like to buy another cake? Oh, no. I only buy one cake from each bakery one time. Because <laughs> if you keep buying cakes from you, you will become dependent and unsustainable. <laughs> Why are you in my bakery? <laughs> well, we're launching this new study to show, to, uh, to see why bakers are burning out, and we want you to join a focus group. <laughs> this is what we face with the overhead myth. Now that it's down, we need to kick it so it never gets back up again to haunt us. But we have to move on to other things, the sustainability myth. This is the myth that if we just work hard enough, all of us in this sector just work hard enough, then our, found, our organizations will reach this state of funding nirvana where unicorns just fly overhead, raining down coins, <laughs> and everyone has perfect wind-blown hair all the time. It doesn't work, and it's still pretty ridiculous. Again, if we apply this to other sectors, other, um, to the for-profit sector, for example, you go into a restaurant, or you go to Blue Star Donuts or whatever, and you say, hey, I wanna get some, some donuts. I hear you guys make really amazing donuts that beat out voodoo donuts. Yeah. And yeah, but what's your sustainability plan? <laughs> How do I know you're gonna be around in five years? <laughs> well, well, we're going to go out and spin signs in the corner and we'll you know, reach out to sponsors and all this stuff. That's not good enough for me. I'm not gonna buy any donuts from you until you're more sustainable. Well, if everyone does that, then the, then the bakery or this donut shop is going to close, right? So the focusing on sustainability prevents an organization from becoming sustainable, right? My wife is a fourth grade teacher and uh, it's a really, it's a 95% low income class. And imagine we go to her and we say, hey, I love this program that you make, that you have, what do you call it, the fourth grade? <laughs> but what are you gonna do when my money runs out? How are you gonna sustain this? I, it manifests in a sustainability question, which is what are you gonna do when our money runs out, right? And I know it's well-meaning. But we learn how to BS this question. 
we say things like, oh, you know, we're gonna increase our board staff capacity to fundraise, reach out individual donors, we'll connect with other funders. We will explore, learn, uh, we will explore earn income strategies by selling macaroni artwork made by our kids. <laughs> All that is a euphemism for we will leave you alone and bother other people. <laughs> right? I actually have standardized responses to the sustainability question as a blog post. You can just go there and you can just copy and paste. <laughs> and an ED contacted me and said, Vu, I use your short version. There's like nine versions. <laughs> you know, there's like a long version, a short version. There's like a haiku version for most grants. Uh, that's like 12 characters or less for your grants. She said, I used your short version and I got $25,000. <laughs> yeah, just, you just Google that. Don't, don't, you know, just don't, don't have to write again. I just wrote it for you. <laughs> so we need to get rid of it. If society wants and values the work that we do and thinks the work that we do is awesome and it wants us to be sustainable, then it needs to sustain it, sustain the work that we do, right? It should not be on our own shoulders, sustain all the work that we do. Okay, I'm moving on to biz planning. <laughs> biz planning, are there any for profits in this room? You're too afraid to raise your hand, aren't you? <laughs> okay. I love for profits. For profits are amazing. I don't know a single nonprofit that makes vodka, so I'm really appreciative <laughs> for for profits. But there is this superiority complex that we have. Like, for profits ha have this superiority complex. And because we rely on them to join our boards and for donations and sponsorships, we oftentimes just kind of absorb that superiority complex. And then we allow bisplaining to go on. Bisplaining is like mansplaining, but a business doing it to a nonprofit, right? By the way, did you know there's meta mansplaining? When a man explains what mansplaining is in a <laughs> condescending way? And it doesn't, we had to really get out of that because we, we start internalizing it. It becomes this nonprofit inferiority complex, right? But businesses, for profits, and nonprofits are completely different. We, they're not comparable. We should be learning stuff from one another, but we can't be emulating them as if they know the answers. It's, I was, um, got into a minor Twitter feud with someone who was like, you know what nonprofits need to do? You guys need to be more start uppy. That was his word. You need to be more start uppy. <laughs> I was like, dude, why, why? This is like the paleo diet. <laughs> does anyone, is, does anyone, is anyone on the, on the paleo diet? Okay. <laughs> so the paleo diet, I was, I'm trying to understand the paleo diet. And I was talking to another friend who's like, I don't get the paleo diet either. You're trying to eat like a caveman, right? Which is, you're just eating like meat and rocks or, or something, I don't know. <laughs> But why are you emulating cavemen? They had a life expectancy of like 30 years, right? All of us here would be like senior cavemen by, by now, right? Why would we try to emulate startups when 90% of them, them fail? In fact, 50% of for-profits fail within four years or so, right? They do amazing work. We need them, but that doesn't mean we should be emulating them when they're so completely different. One difference is that as we do our work and as we become more successful in our work, our costs increase without an equal increase in revenues. If Apple sells a million iPhones, you know, they get a bunch of money. If they sell another million, they get more money. If we have, if we serve 50 kids at our after school program, you know, and then we serve 100 kids next year, that does not mean that our grants and our donation will automatically double. We end up getting more and more stressed, right? Because we're not gonna turn down kids, right? So that's one huge disadvantage. And we can't pass on our expenses you know, when, when federal regulation goes up and we have minimum wage laws and things, you know, which are really good. But we cannot pass it on to our clients the way the businesses may be able to. So comparing businesses to nonprofits like comparing an apple to a porcupine, it just it doesn't work. Another thing is that our, the work that we do is so complicated. The outcomes and the outputs are really complex. And imagine again if we go to an apple store and say, hey, you guys sold like a million iPhones? That's great, but that's like an output. That's not really an outcome. <laughs> what are people doing with your iPhones? Are they using the iPhones to apply for jobs? How many of them get jobs because they use their iPhones? 
Are they using their iPhones now when they get injured or they get sick and they use WebMD on their iPhone so that prevents them from going to emergency rooms, which saves taxpayers money? How much taxpayers' money is being saved by your iPhones? <laughs> that is what we deal with in this sector, right? So we have to understand these, these challenges as we go about doing social good. Because it's been leading to the nonprofit Hunger Games. <laughs> Society and others have been forcing us into the nonprofit Hunger Games. Who's seen the Hunger Games? OK, everyone here, basically. Or, you know, or just the cool people. <laughs> um, Hunger Games, there's these districts, and they send two kids each to fight to the death to be broadcasted on live TV. And in many ways, this feels a lot like our field, right? Really talented, brilliant people fighting for resources to do social good. And it's been leading to all sorts of terrible things. For example, um, the siloing of our work. Our work is interconnected. Everything is related to everything else. But we end up treating our own organization and sometimes our own position as the most important thing, and we focus on getting resources for that versus the entire sector and the society at large. Right? It's been leading to us hoarding donors and funders. Sometimes we even hoard clients, like, these are my clients, you can't serve them. That makes no sense. Right? We have to put an, an end to it. And community-centric fundraising, something I've been pushing people towards. We have been getting funders, we have this donor-centric model that I think a lot about. And it's really about you know, making sure that we appreciate our donors and we make sure that they feel like the heroes in the stories that we tell, make them feel good about themselves. And they do some great stuff. We are very appreciative of that. But I think sometimes it goes too far. And what happens is that we end up treating donors as if they were people standing on the shores of a lake, you know, feeding the ducks. And we tell them, thanks to you, we fed 50 ducks. We prevented 50 ducks from going hungry today. And then they feel good about themselves. And then maybe they buy more bread to feed ducks the next year or something. And I think that is not the way that we should be getting donors to think about this. It otherizes the people that we serve. You know, It becomes charity. It becomes something that we do to other people. You know, not with them. We have to get everyone to believe that they are a duck in the same pond and that their fate is linked to all the other ducks and to the pond. And I think that's what the belief is. Yeah, you can go to the next one. What the belief is social good. Sometimes I think about like this question and it becomes very esoteric. It becomes philosophical. And now the marijuana is legalized in Washington State and Oregon. You know, we sit around talking a lot about this stuff, and we're like, dude, what is social good, you know? Yeah, what is this? It's like, it's like doing good for society and stuff. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that was just hypothetical, OK? Um, and, I, and again, I think I, I define, I don't really know how I define social good. But I think it's really about going back to this sort of thing where we think that everyone you know, belongs in the same pond. That is, it's that we all belong to this. We're all ducks. We all need to support one another. And it's not just about, you know, like charity and pity. It's about creating a pond that works for everyone, that ensures that every duck is not excluded from this pond and is thriving in the pond because our fates are tied to every duck being successful in this pond. Um, that's, yeah. So, but there is something that I'm, I've been thinking a lot about, just the social good paradox, which is, it kept me up at night, uh, last night, last, actually. And I was just thinking about how, you know, we think about social good. And it seems to be like a great thing for us to think about what is good for society. But honestly, I was thinking about that in history, there's been countless times where social good has been used, you know, to exclude people, to do just terrible things. So social good itself is used to destroy social good. Examples would be, for example, eugenics, right? Where we think about like who is like, there was the, the movement a long time ago where it's like we want like the best genes in society. You know, we want everyone to be, 
to be blonde and blue-eyed. And because it's, it's social good. Or right now in the national discussion, it's been really scary things. Like, and it's been justifying xenophobia and misogyny. You know, it's been justifying hatred of immigrants because we think, oh, you know, well, what, what are they contributing to social good, right? So social good is something that can be destructive, just like sustainability one. Sometimes when we focus on that thing itself, we start losing track of what it actually means to achieve it. I was talking to an executive director uh, who called me when I was driving home from a meeting, and she was so frustrated. She was running this senior hot meal program, and a donor, uh, a funder came to visit. And the funder was like, so you serve some seniors hot meals. That's wonderful. What is the outcome? What's the outcome of this program? And my ED friend was like, um, the seniors come in hungry and they leave full? <laughs> yeah, but what does that do for society? What I mean, like, are the seniors? And then, of course, being an ED, she pivoted really quick because we are trained to do this, to say the right things in order to get money. So we say things like, oh, yeah, well, because the seniors are well fed, they no longer are, they don't get sick as much, they don't fall down the stairs. And because they don't fall down the stairs and they're not being sent to the emergency room, it saves taxpayers money. And she just felt sick saying that. And I think we have to understand where we cross the line between social good and completely erasing the intrinsic values of the individual. Right? And so I think about the so that thing that we are trained to think about. We think about, like, what, what, is, what are you doing? And then you go up this chain, the so that chain. Well, we are providing after school programs to kids. Why? So that they can get better grades in school. So that they can graduate from high school. So that they can go to college. So that they can get a job. So that they can contribute back to society and save taxpayers money. We have been trained to use this economic model to see and to measure the worth of individuals in our society. And I'm thinking, why do we stop at the so that chain at economic? We can go further, right? So that we have a stronger society. So that we are happier. All of us are happier. So that the unicorns can come back to our world. <laughs> they've been disappointed in many of us. And they've left. And now we need, to come, we need them to come back. That's why we do the work that we do, right? Um, so nonprofits role in affecting social good. I get so frustrated by people whenever I write things and they're like, you know what, you guys should just be grateful for all the money we give you. Why, why? I mean, when, when I pay for something, I get something in return. You know, I get vodka in return if I, if I spend some money. When I donate to charity, I get nothing in return. It's all about, you know, just helping these poor, unwashed people out there. And I think people don't realize, and oftentimes we do not realize what we do and how we affect social good, right? We are like air, and the for-profit sector is like food. And there's like foodies, and there's like all these magazines about food and all these channels about food. And there's like this, you know, there's not like an airy, you know, I'm like, I'm an airy, I go to different places and breathe, you know, to appreciate different like airs, right? No one appreciates air because it's all around us and it's invisible. Well, people don't appreciate the work that we do because they don't, oftentimes they don't see it because we're really nice individuals. But everyone benefits from the work that, that we do. You know, if people are walking down the street and it's safe, it's probably because some of us are working on neighborhood safety, you know, and providing services to our community members so they have places to stay. You know, if people appreciate like the art and the parks and stuff, there's some of us working on those different things. You know, if, you, if they're not stepping on gum or litters, because some of us are teaching kids about environmental justice. People don't appreciate all this stuff and because we're really nice, we don't understand that and we don't acknowledge that either among ourselves. And, and then we're pitted into this Hunger Games and we fight against one another. 
So I think we have to really understand our roles, that we play a really critical role. Imagine a nonprofit or a society that, that does not have nonprofits. Would any of us want to live in that society? Well, maybe, I don't know. There's some of us who really should not be here at all, right? Some of us who are like food banks and homeless shelters. In a perfect world, we would not exist. So we have to think about like which nonprofits are there, but in the world that, we, that we're living in, we are dependent on our nonprofits to provide so much of the work that oftentimes for the for-profits and government sector neglect. Um, so I started thinking about talking with you all because you are the next generation of leaders in the nonprofit sector. And my organization, Rainier Valley Corps, our driving question is, what kind of leaders do we need in this time and place? And what we do is we find talented emerging leaders of color, we give them a full-time fellowship, we pay them their wages and um, health care and uh, educational bonus, and we send them to work at these grassroots organizations for two years. And we hope that they'll remain in the sector. And this is the question that has been guiding our work. And I'm bringing this here, I've been think, reflecting a lot on this question, you know, because things are changing rapidly, our demographics are changing, and all the stuff that we are used to doing and thinking and, and guiding our actions may no longer be relevant to the world that we are moving into. So what kind of leaders do we need? I mean, this sort of version of the heroic leader, the person who is this commanding presence, who is in the spotlight all the time, this idea of that leader is, is kind of is fading away. We're moving towards more of a collective leadership and servant leadership model, where leaders are in the background sometimes, and they're lifting up other people, and they're building connections between people. But I also think about social good. And I think we need leaders who understand the intrinsic values of individual, independent of the value society. It sounds a little esoteric, um, but think about it. You know, if we can all believe that every individual has an intrinsic worth that is outside its worth, what it can actually contribute to society, right? Because we don't think like that. Maybe us in this room do, we in this room do, but people outside, they, they don't. They pass by a person who's experiencing homelessness, and oftentimes they're thinking about, well, you know, what, what are they contributing to society, right? And it seeps, and they look at immigrants and say, you know, why, what are they doing? How are they contributing to our society? Versus thinking about individuals as people with hopes and dreams, you know, and challenges, people as human beings. Sometimes we forget about that as we look into like this thing that is social good, right? We have to understand the intrinsic values and believe in the intrinsic values of individuals. And the other thing is that we have to understand, I think it's called enlightened self-interest, which is that our fate, that we benefit when we work and we help other people. Sometimes I, I work with um, economic, um, educational inequity in, in Seattle. And there's just extreme inequity. Even though we have Boeing and Google and Microsoft up there, you know, we have a lot of challenges. And many schools don't get the resources that they need. Some schools are well-resourced because they have parents who work at these companies. And there's one school that raised $300,000 in one night of fundraising. And then we have some schools that raise $1,000 organizing a book drive or a bake sale. And, some, and we go to some of these schools and these parents and say, do you mind maybe just putting 10% of the $300,000 or others into a pool that could be shared with the smaller schools? Well, some people really, they go for that. But I think there's a majority who would fight that and say, well, my kids don't go to those schools. Why would I give money to the kids down there? Well, I think it's important for us to get people to understand that their kids are going to grow up and they're going to marry other people's kids. <laughs> yeah, your kids can grow up and they're gonna marry other people's kids. And you're gonna be served by doctors who are other people's kids, and mechanics who are other people's kids, and police officers who are other people's kids. I think there was one guy who, was, uh, who didn't have any kids, and he was donating a ton to education. 
And people asked him, like, why do you do that? And he said, well, I don't want society to be run by a bunch of idiots. <laughs> That's enlightened self-interest. So I think this combination of the intrinsic values of individuals, seeing everyone as an individual who is worthy of help and services and love versus just what they can do to contribute to the social good is going to lead to social good. And the same is if we can believe that we personally benefit from social good, that will also bring about social good. Amber, fly, cough, okay. So what do we need to do? Okay, next one. <laughs> I want to make sure you see a cute baby animal before I run into this list. Okay, bullet list. We gotta own our own awesomeness, okay? We are really awesome, but we're really nice. And we have to just get out of that niceness and push back sometimes. I was talking to an ED who got terrified because every year her city releases this list of who has the most overhead, the nonprofits with the worst overhead ratios in her city. She's like, I don't wanna end up on that list, you know? And I'm thinking, why do you not just question the validity of this list in the first place? You know, why? Because you're like worried about this. It gives this list power. Write an op-ed and say this list is ridiculous and has no validity, right? We need to own just our influence and our power and start using it. We gotta stop feeling inferior to for-profits, right? They do great things, we can appreciate them, we can learn from them but we need to stop saying that we need to be more and more like them. We need to be more innovative and disruptive or whatever the terminology is that they use. We need to demand equal partnership with funders and donors. Another ED that I talked to, and it's like, you need to give back, uh, give feedback to foundations. And she said, I don't wanna bite the hands that feed me. I'm like, no one is feeding you, right? You're an, we are equal partners. In doing this, we cannot do the work without donors and funders. They cannot do the work without us. And for so long, we've been like, you know, we've, we feel like we're, we're just asking for money and not getting, giving anything back. That's not how we should be seeing, seeing this. We are equal partners. We're like, I don't know, symb, symb, symbiotic creatures, like the clownfish and sea anemone. They work together, okay? We gotta think about, about that. Gotta end the Hunger Games. And how do we do that? I don't know, the simple things you can do, like start talking to other people in the sector, connect to them, you know, introduce them to your donors and your funders. We sometimes, we get freaked out, it's like, well, if I do that, then they're gonna take all their money and leave. What I find is that if we are generous with one another, it creates this domino effect where other people become generous with us. What I find is that when I introduce one of my donors to someone else who does something great, but that my organization doesn't do, that donor tends to give to both organizations now. And then that organization is really appreciative and they introduce me to their donors and then it creates this chain reaction, right? And that brings about social good. We gotta invest in our people, all right? We gotta pay people more. We gotta get out of this scrappy martyr mindset where so many of us are just sitting on chairs that are crappy, that we got from Craigslist. <laughs> you deserve a good chair. <laughs> you do. Go back and tell your boss that Vu says <laughs> you deserve a good chair, right? We cannot keep underpaying our people. We cannot keep perpetuating inequity as we work to fight it. I'm glad that the new federal overtime laws are coming out. I know that it's gonna to be tough for many of us. But I think like flossing or like exercise, sometimes people have to force us to do it. But it's ultimately good for us. And I think we need to start pushing for funders to pay more, yes. But we ourselves have to accept this philosophy that we cannot fight for equity and also in perpetuate inequity at the same time. We gotta collaborate across sectors. We need to do a better job collaborating with one another, but we have to start thinking about how do we work with 
for profits and the media and the governments. We haven't been doing enough of that, and it's going to take all of us to do that. We've got to move beyond good intentions. I know we're talking about race and equity. That's a topic that we is really critical for us. Equ equity has become like coconut water. Everyone's drinking it all the time after hot yoga and stuff. <laughs> but people are just talking about it. And you cannot talk about equity and think that you're bringing about equity. If you're not moving resources and changing systems and processes, then that's not going to bring about equity. And you're just perpetuating fakeity. It's what my friends um, call it. We've got to re-examine hiring and other practices. And again, how do we bring about equity? There's certain small things we can do. List salary ranges. Stop asking people for salary histories. Why does anyone give a crap what you made in the previous job? It just makes sure that people who are underpaid continue to become underpaid, and they tend to be women and people of color. And Massachusetts just recently made it illegal to ask for salary history. We can do that in every other state, too. You can do it. We got we to gotta work on these things, right? We can't just keep talking about these things. We got to move on it. Hiring practices is another thing, you know? We use the same system where, oh, you have a typo in your cover, well, we'll eliminate this person. You know, as a person who was born in Vietnam and who grew up, uh, who spent a lot of my years over there and I was an ESL kid, you know, I still make a lot of typos. A lot of my writing is to compensate for the fact that I was made fun of a lot as, as an ESL kid growing up. And I still have typos. But I think the fact that I can speak three and a half languages should make up for the fact that I have a few typos. <laughs> So we have to start thinking about this. Like, why do we use formal education as a way to filter in people when we know that education is often inequitable and leaves out a lot of people, right? If someone has a ton of experience, do we need them to have a bachelor's degree to do this work? I was telling the group last night that I had dinner with that having been in ED for 10 years, I don't think you really need like a, a BA or a master's to be a, a good executive director. You know, if you have strong experience, really the biggest thing that you need is high threshold for pain. <laughs> so you just need to have, like, that, like the one interview question I would have I were on a board, interviewing for EDs would be like, how long can you hold this ice cube? <laughs> that would be the interview question I would have. So we have to start re-examining all hiring practices, Board practices, we keep complaining about the lack of diversity on our boards, and then we go to our board, and it's like Robert's Rules. There's no time for relationship building. There's like terrible snacks. It's some baby carrots and some hummus. Like, this is not how many communities and many cultures work. Then we wonder why people don't come back to our boards anymore. All these things that we are used to may no longer be relevant in this new world that we're moving towards. Kind of this more diverse, more vibrant, interesting world that, that we're moving towards. OK, I have to talk about Battlestar Galactica, OK? Because <laughs> I brought it up. <laughs> Battlestar Galactica, so what can we learn from Battlestar Galactica? What the frack can we learn? Um, I don't know, who watches Battlestar Galactica? Woo! Yeah, eight people. <laughs> Battlestar Galactica is so cool, you should all watch it. Okay, but they have these Cylons, and you know, there's been this war between the Cylons and the human beings, and then the Cylons kind of evolve, and they actually look exactly like the human beings. And they start developing like morality and ethics and stuff. And, but the human beings still call, call them toasters and treat them really disdainfully. That tells me that I'm nearing my time limit. Um, and we start seeing them as others, you know, even though they look like us, uh, even though they are, they're human beings as well. And this is what I've been seeing. We otherize a lot of, of people. And we always see people as, as other. There's us and there's, there's other people. And I think we need to put a stop to that. Clients are not other people, right? They're us. Other people's children are not other people's children. They're like our kids too. And we have to move everyone to thinking that way we're going to bring about social good. Okay. 
Winter is here. <laughs> I'm moving from Battlestar Galactica to Game of Thrones. <laughs> Who watches Game of Thrones? A lot more people. <laughs> Game, of, Game of Thrones is pretty awesome, and I think that the nonprofit sector is a lot like Game of Thrones, except with less frontal nudity. <laughs> well, we have the wildlings on one side of this huge wall, like this gigantic 700 foot, 300 mile wide wall. And they cannot break through, you know, like they're like savages. And on this other side are people from King's Landing and they're jostling for power, all this stuff. Everyone, when, when there's, you know, even though there's a wall and people are fighting for power and the wildlings are trying to get over the other side, people are neglecting the fact that there are ice zombies coming, <laughs> okay? It's a really good show. And the ice zombies are not going to care. If you're a wildling or if you're on the other side in King's Landing, they're just going to kill you dead because <laughs> they're ice zombies. And while we're fighting each other, we forget about that. right? Well, we have ice zombies. We have the ice zombies of racism and poverty you know, and all these terrible things that we have, environmental degradation. Um, you know, and we have, and we, we neglect all those things because we're thinking about like walls and we think about jostling for resources. We have to move everyone towards fighting ice zombies. Okay, last slide. We're unicorns. So people ask me, Vu, why do you love unicorns so much? What's with you in unicorns? That's kind of weird, dude. I'm gonna tell you a quick story. Um, I got my master's in social work and then I couldn't find a job. And uh, <laughs> 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 and I found this freelance writing gig, writing for a company called Bellacera. They do these, this unicorn card game where you buy this card, this package um, of unicorn cards, and they each, like these cool little, little unicorns and magical ponies and stuff. And you go home, you log onto this website, and you unlock using a code on your card like a, a, a unicorn that you can take around this virtual world and talk to other unicorns and go on little quests and grow things and teach other unicorns about love and friendship and compassion and stuff. And I wrote some of the dialogues of what the unicorns said. So I would write things like, hey, Sparkle Wing, can you grow me a moonflower? <laughs> yeah. And I, it made me think, you know, we are the unicorns that we seek. We are the ones going out, teaching people, and, and, and making people think about love and compassion and friendship and social justice and things like that. We are the unicorns of our world. That's why I like unicorns. You're unicorns. And I think we've been thinking about like being the change that you want to see. Right? And we think, of, we, lift up, we think of iconic leaders like Gandhi and MLK Jr. and, and, and Nelson Mandela. And we think they are like, incredible people who bring about social good. You know, but I think behind Gandhi and MLK Jr., there's probably someone organizing a conference and filing paper and raising money and entering things into the database and tweeting something. Okay, maybe not tweeting something, but you know what I mean. right? The work that you do every single day matters because these huge changes in society cannot happen you know, unless there's a wave of smaller incremental changes that take place every single day, and that's what you're doing. And I think it's important for us to recognize that because maybe society doesn't acknowledge the work that we do and how important it is. And sometimes we forget to acknowledge it in each other, but we need to take time to do that because we cannot take ourselves for granted. There's just way too much at stake. And now that I have two kids, a little five-month-old boy and another three-year-old toddler, I start thinking about what kind of world I want to send my kids out into. you know. And I get really grateful, and I get really thankful for the work that you do every single day to make it a safe and strong and just society for my family, for my kids. So thank you so much for all that you do. Enjoy the rest of your conference.
Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everyone. You're awesome. Do we have some time for a quick Q&A? We, Q &A we do I have time for a Q&A. Yeah, OK. You beat me to it. So does anyone have any questions? Megan and I have microphones, so just raise your hand, and we'll try not to fall over you to get there. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mitzi. I'm from YMPN Boston. And you mentioned something very quickly um, about hoarding funders, clients, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry, can everyone hear me now? I just realized that the, I was not speaking close enough. But I was wondering, there is this pressure to find your niche, to find the, the group of people, the cause, the issue that does make you stand out and help your nonprofit survive. And so not necessarily about hoarding, but it is this fear that if you are duplicating efforts, and I'm in Boston where we have one of the highest concentrations of nonprofits per square foot, um, <laughs> just how do, how do you see us balancing the hoarding and the recognition that we do need to find the, the thing that we do best, if that makes sense. But thank you very much for your talk. I, I should have thanked you at the, at the outset, and so thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know it's a challenge. Sometimes it's easier for me as a speaker to go up here like, you guys should do all this stuff. Yeah, give everyone raises. Give all your staff like a new chair. Yeah, I know. Because I also run a nonprofit. I'm stealing Sharpies. How, <laughs> you know, the idealism that we have runs against reality oftentimes, every single day. And I think it is, it's, yeah, we should acknowledge that, absolutely. There is the reality that, that we face. But I also think that we tend to go into the scarcity mindsets, right? And we think there's not enough resources out there. And we start thinking about, you know, our own survival, right? And I really think that we need to get out of it. It's, it's, it's a paradox. The more we think about survival, actually the less likely we are to survive, oftentimes, in this sector. Just like the more we think about sustainability versus like actually just doing the work and convincing funders to you know funders and donors to support it, the less sustainable we we are. You know, the more we think about social good and who can fit into that and contribute to social good, then sometimes we the less social good we we do. So I think it's the, it's very similar to to that. Yes, there is a balance that we we got to figure out, but so much historically has been towards that end of fighting and survival. If we can just inch along even just a little bit, maybe just, just think about you know, what you can do right away that won't jeopardize your organization. Maybe go out and talk to other people more. You know, maybe um, make some connections. Introduce a funder or a donor to another organization that does like, good work. Maybe start talking to them. Go to happy hour with, with a few of them. Right? So I don't know. I don't have a, a solution. I just think that we need to get out of this mindset of scarcity and fear. Yeah. Hello, Vu. Thank you very much for speaking today. Uh, my name is Cole St. Arnold. I'm from YMP in uh, Twin Cities. And uh, my organization, we like to focus on saying we're not deficit-based, we're asset-based. But we're really trying to focus on what are we doing well in our community and how can we build on that. And uh, last time I heard you speak, it was in Minneapolis. And I want to know, like, you've probably spoken in different, a lot of different places and talked to a lot of uh, nonprofit professionals. What are we doing good around the country? What can we build upon that are our individual assets throughout the country? And, who should we steal from, I guess, too? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of good that is done. I'm, I'm always impressed by how creative nonprofit professionals are. I mean, we are, it's incredible, the work that we do and how creative we are. And I think people take that for granted. And there's a lot of assumptions. You know, for example, we don't think poor people can manage money, and that's why they're poor. If you think about it, poor people are probably the best at managing money because they have to think about every single dime that they spend, right? And we don't acknowledge that. And it's the same with the nonprofit sector, is that, you know, oh, you, they're always struggling for money and all this stuff. But it's the opposite. We, because of the restrictions put on us, 
we are probably the most creative, innovative people out there right now. Um, and I, I think there's lots of cool things that, that we're doing all the time. I mean, we, our sector is more focused on equity and social justice than anyone else. You know, I was attending this leadership program and it was a mixture of nonprofit leaders and for-profit leaders and governmental leaders. And the for-profit people were, they had their minds blown when we had discussions about poverty. They're like, oh my gosh, so poor people die sooner? It affects their health? And the, poor, the nonprofit people were like, oh my god, why am I here? <laughs> you know, I have stuff to do. Like, we are, we have to acknowledge just how awesome we are and the stuff we are doing right. And there are cool things that are, that are going on. People are using art creatively to engage kids. You know, people are talking about giving money to people in low income directly. Um, there are people who are reaching out and doing some really cool sector across sector collaborations. I think the, the Minnesota Water Council has been doing some cool stuff where they get all the people focused on water um, and the university to do like water engineering and, and the for-profits who are doing like water like related jobs and stuff. Water's gonna be a huge thing when the zombie apocalypse comes. <laughs> people are gonna drive to, to Minnesota. That's, that's gonna happen. You know, there's the Columbus Partnership where they're talking about economic development and it's getting the for-profit and the government sector and nonprofits together and academia together and start thinking about how to right. you know, advance um, their, their city. So there are really cool stuff that we can look to towards um, replicating and things. Absolutely. We're doing some really great stuff. Here and here. Hi. Uh, my name is Beach. I, uh, I'm over here. Oh, yeah. And uh, I've been an executive director. I'm a CEO. And I want to first thank you for your comments. You speak the truth. If you are not sure, this man speaks the truth. <laughs> I'm like the Donald Trump of nonprofit. That's what I say. <laughs> and I would, it's only 10, but I want to buy you a beer, man. So uh, <laughs> let me know. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you. That's the best comment ever. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I think there was one back there. And <laughs> Hi there, I'm Britt Stetson with YNP in Portland and Harper's Playground. Um, I think like a lot of us in this room, I start my Monday morning reading the Nonprofit with Balls blog. And it's always kind of that great um, inspiring start to the week of like, yes, this is the truth. We are unicorns. We're going to get going with our week and be inspired. And then by Wednesday, it's very easy to get ingrained in the tasks and kind of lose that inspiration. So as I'm wondering as a leader, as an executive director, what tactical things you encourage your staff to do or encourage other managers to do to keep that inspiration going throughout the week, um, throughout the menial tasks that we do to keep the big picture in our minds? Yeah, for managers out there, I, I think just figuring out what, what motivates people to get into the sector, right? I, we inherit a lot of bad practices from, from other sectors. Um, and I think some of it is like micromanagement and not trusting our staff, not giving people autonomy to do things. People are just happier when you know, we can figure out what it is that people can do together, get their work plan in line, their goals and metrics and whatever, and then let them do their job. I think as young people, like this is, we just, we need the flexibility. Like I want to, I only want to work six hours on Friday. I'll work 12 hours on the other day, you know, and I'm working all the time at midnight and others. As long as I'm getting my job done, like leave me alone so I can, and support me to do that, to do that work, right? So that, there's the autonomy piece of doing this work. Then there's just the occasional appreciation of our work, you know, and, and, and just taking time to get to know our colleagues. Uh, my, my team and I, we just did just a fun day. Just like we have, that's it. Like you're mandated to come to this fun day and it's all day and we're not gonna do any work and we're just gonna go downtown and we're just gonna go to a park and have a picnic or whatever it is that we're, we're trying to do. You know, this work is, is really hard. But also there's logistics, like paying people more will increase their morale by quite a lot, you know? <laughs> Giving them strong healthcare is important. Giving them flexibility, 
having stronger family leave policies is really important, right? Yeah, and just really acknowledging that and, and, and practicing what, what we preach regarding family leave policies and vacation time and being understanding with, with one another, I think those are the things we have to take care of because otherwise self-care becomes a burden on us. It becomes another to-do thing that we, have to, that we individually have to do. It is really the organization's responsibility to figure out a culture that works so that everyone is thriving in, in that nonprofit. We have time for one more question. I don't like uh -oh. confrontation. <laughs> okay, sorry. We'll have our own Hunger Games here. That would be really cool. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm a member of the VULI. Uh, I'm a fangirl. So actually, one of the things I've been looking forward to today is trying to get a selfie with you. Um, so you're, sp you're speaking to the, to the choir. You know, obviously, even if people here don't already know you and how you represent us and you speak the truth and, and come at it from the perspective that many of us are growing with, I'm starting to find that there's this very exciting new world, a new way of looking at corporate social responsibility where I'm finding more and more people, especially young people who, I'm from San Francisco, they're deciding between working at Twitter, working at Google, one of the things they're looking at is corporate social responsibility. So I'm wondering whether you've had any audience to represent us to some of these corporations to start explaining to them how their time, their money, their resources, and so forth will provide us what we need to make it so that they have future employees, they have future customers, and so forth. So I'm just curious whether you've had that type of audience, and if so, how that went. I talk mainly to nonprofits and also foundation. Um, and it can be different. Uh, I do think sometimes, oftentimes, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. But I think there's something to be said about we sometimes don't believe some of the messages. We don't, we don't really internally believe some of these things. you know. And so it's not really preaching to the choir if a lot of us, like we listen to it, but we don't genuinely believe in things such as that we are worth you know, a good chair to sit on. Right? Or we don't need to emulate the business sector. Or we don't have to try to be like a startup men, you know, mentality or whatever. Or that we are equal partners to foundations because everywhere I go, there's this, basically our sector sometimes is like full of brilliant people paralyzed by fear. You know, fear of losing funding, fear of their nonprofits going under, fear of not being able to pay their staff fear of making the wrong networking decision or spending their time or, what, or whatever. So I think a lot of my message is that we have to get out of this mentality. And I don't think, I think some of us are, are really starting to get out of that. But there's still quite a few of us who don't. And we cannot convince donors and corporate people if we ourselves do not believe it. We always go in with this sort of like, oh, thank you so much for giving us you know, $5,000 to do this. You know, we really appreciate that. Versus, thank you for investing in this. This is how you benefit. Also, we need you to give eighty thousand dollars next year. Okay, if you want a safe community for your community, for your employees to live in, and for their kids to grow up in, that you need to invest in this work. Right? That's a completely different tone. Right? If we go in with this sort of supplicant mentality, as so many of us have been trained to do, then that is the response that we get, and then we get thankful for the small amounts of support that we get. And we have to get people to understand that they benefit from everything that we do. We personally benefit from everything we do. And that's the only way we can convince the rest of the society to invest in the work that we do. Thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate it.